Hello and welcome to a new session of Art Talk. Uh, today we are going to be featuring the artwork of Doug Warner. Uh, I am Jim Scherter. I am a professor of art and design here at Mott Community College. We want to welcome you all and welcome everybody in our audience today. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined by a panel, um, Patty Warner. Thank you, Patty. And some of Doug's former students, Brian Liljeblad, Denise Davidek, and Darcy Bowden. So thank you all for joining us today as we kind of talk about Doug, his legacy, the works that he have, has created, and his influences and Im impacts on the three of you. So welcome. So Patty, can you tell us a little bit about Doug? Sure. Doug, I mean, the people who knew him, like these people here, Am I speaking okay? Can you you're hear me? Good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> he loved teaching. He loved making art. He loved these guys. I mean, he bragged about these guys. And, um, but he was, everyone always said, like, why did, he, why did he do what he did? And it's interesting because he started out as an architecture student mm -hmm. in, in Oklahoma. But he fell in love with the fine arts and then quickly moved to fine arts and majored in fine arts all the way. And he got this job over here, I think, in the 50s? 57. 57. Yeah, 1957. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he came to Mott. Right. And he thought, you know, maybe it's just a stop and then go on. But he loved it here. And he loved the, the program and the, and the faculty and really gained long-term friendships with people like Sam Morello and Tom News and Bob Caskey and... Brian, <laughs> and um, so anyway, uh, this particular show, the ones we chose, we started, everything was named notations, and everyone said, what does notations mean? This, this piece of the back, this handmade paper with the colored pencil, okay, that was the first series of the notation series, and he was influenced heavily by Beethoven's manuscripts, mm -hmm. And he would just, he would just like feverishly work on them like Beethoven did. And the one story that I can tell that I really love that was the ultimate compliment. He had a piece of that, of those in um, U of M library, or U of M Ann Arbor Art Gallery. And we walked up there. Uh, it wasn't the opening. The whole place was vacant, and my husband and I woke, walked up there, and we could see this gentleman playing air violin in front of it. And we walked over, and we said, um, oh, he said, I just want to play this. I just have to play this. And I just, he said, then the, Doug talked to him about the, the, the influence, and the guy was knocked out by it, but he played something that, you know, that was so much fun. That's he incredible. that piece, yeah. And then um, these pieces, to back up for a little bit, the Triangle series, were, they were in the 70s. That was before notations. And this is the Joshua Tree series. And um, that's actually done from a puzzle piece of one of his sons. It's not the Joshua Tree in California, but, you know, that little, it looks like an apple tree. It's a, it was a puzzle piece. Oh. And so the, these are the notations. These are all called notations, too, with a, a long uh, Roman numeral number after him. He didn't name them, but he wanted people to look at them as, and if what they saw is fine. I mean, he didn't want to dictate what was in the painting itself. But you could tell he's influenced by primitive uh, civilizations, music, um, especially when he's got into the adding at ladders into it, the Pueblos of the Southwest. So it's, anyway, and <clears throat> this was, uh, these paintings were really, he worked on these every single day and he would probably turn out about one or two a week, I think, for a while there. Um, they're made with vermiculite and acrylic medium that he would mix in together and then he would add found objects and other things. Brian said that we should show these, if you wanna see the, the sequence of how they were made, he has a demonstration piece. So. Where are you gonna start here? 
I don't know if they're. Do uh, yeah, I think the bottom one is the first one. I think I can take one. Yeah. Thanks. So these were the process he used right. in creating. And you could see. See, this is why we had you as a panel. We needed people to hold these. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's what I told him. He said, what are you going to do with that? I said, you're going to hold Look them. At, there's the perfect number for us, right? Yeah. And this is what be the... <laughs> um, that's the starting one. That, then he put the gray over it, rubbed over the gray. I'm not sure, Bri. Maybe that... And this is the finished one. But he would give these... But he would do art talks. He oh, would I'm, show people... I'm thinking yeah, the red is, there's red under here, so yeah, there's red, then the gray, no, there's rust under here, yeah, so that's the first one. okay, that's the first one, second. yeah, Third. and then this is the final piece. So um, what was happening, Patty mentioned the vermiculite um, <laughs> and acrylic medium, so vermiculite is a uh, is a mineral, it was, it's mined, uh, used to be used as an insulation material in, in buildings and houses. Um, so he would, it's uh, little um, particles or granules or whatever. And um, so he would mix that with the acrylic medium and it would make it into like uh, a, uh, kind of slush that he would trowel on to the surface and then he would start working back into that um, combination of acrylic medium and vermiculite before it set up. You know, the, the acrylic medium would eventually uh, dry or start to dry and then, so he had a, a working period that he worked out uh, whatever number of minutes or whatever i don't know it de would depend on how much water was mixed in with the uh, medium and the vermiculite but yeah sometimes he would like put a layer on and then go back and smoke his pipe and rock <laughs> <coughs> put a layer on and then smoke his pipe and rock at his chair and kind of look at it look at it and look at it and then he'll go out. he would sometimes even make his own um instruments out of nails, brushes, you know, and you would gouge in things and to kind of create the relief. Right, and, and right. And it's so and it's what's interesting about these is when the sun hits them, like several people uh they own them, it's totally different painting on, on a you know, on the east side or west side or yeah. Now his studio, he had a studio. Was that in the house or did he have an outside he studio He started, space? when he started the Notatia series, it was in our basement. And then he had a studio for years down above the torch, ah. which was quite nice. <laughs> Gary Gebhardt owned the bar then and um, a former student that he loved. I didn't even think about Gary, but he's never here. And so, um, and he had that, that was a sanctuary for years. He would go there every single day seven in the morning and come home like around three and just create and people said, oh, does he have a show coming up? He did belong to a gallery in Detroit called Joe Shapili that he always had to work you know, for a show, but he just had to make art to make art. And I think that's what all you guys did too. You still do, you just. So I wanna to get to all three of you, but first, could you clarify for everyone? Because for me, I came in probably near the end as a student of Doug's career, and I never had any interactions with Doug. Oh, so Doug really? was unknown to me. Oh, really? I mean, I knew. I heard his name, right? Yeah. But I had never, I didn't have any classes. I came in right when the graphic design program started oh, as yes. a student. Oh, yes. And, uh -huh. yep, so I was with uh, Mara Fulmer, and, but I had, like, Tom Newsom and Tom Bonnert were oh, instructors and Kate Smith. So Doug, Doug is absent from my experience, right. which is sad because I hear such good things. Um, but what was his primary area of teaching when he was, was teaching here? We started out, was it drawing and sculpture, and then 
drawing and then sculpture. Thank you, Brian. I'm so glad you're here, dear. <laughs> drawing and sculpture and then painting. 2D, 3D, that's right. It's funny because I went to school, I had Sam Morello and Caskey, and I never had Doug as a teacher. He would have flunked me probably. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably a good thing. I, just, I saw him all the time, you know. But. So maybe the three of you can share a little bit of insight as his former students. What kind of impact did Doug ha have on you? What kind of um, instructor was he? <laughs> <laughs> Denise has things to say yeah. right off the bat. How was he? he oh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is my wife, so uh, I'm trying to help her out. <laughs> and she's that goes both ways, wouldn't, right, Denise? <laughs> just wait. Wouldn't be anywhere without him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, well, I liked it because he was always so calm. I mean, easy to work with, uh, explained everything you needed to know, or I, I don't know, what else did I like? I liked the fact, well, 2D, in, stop. <laughs> it's, it's, he wants to hear what you're saying. In 2D, <laughs> there, there was a lot more explanation and keeping you going on your task, but once we got to 3D, I liked that we were allowed, we had to find things out on our own and make some of our own mistakes. And in this time in my life, I look back, because I was a teacher for a little while, and letting your kids make some mistakes is really a good thing to do. They learn a lot more that way, mm -hmm. have more confidence in themselves. But he was always, uh, what? He was very nurturing about the art part and what can I say? I love being around him, okay? Liked all the influences that he showed us. I know we went on field trip once with <laughs> Sam and Doug, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> to Detroit, yeah. Anyway. I'm Darcy. Hi, everyone. Um, well, without Doug's influence in my life, I probably wouldn't have had a lifetime of art making. And I think he was the first person who gave, well, I, I had encouragement in high school. But to come to college and, and have his um, gift of approval and, and education really, I don't know, boosted me. And, um, you know, he saw things in my artwork that I didn't see because I, I was 19 when we, when I first had him. And actually, Denise and I were in the same class. And at that time, he was doing this, um, uh, the Joshua's uh, drawing series, too. And I think we were really... Um, we were taking advanced drawing during that time, and we were really uh, beneficiaries of what he was working out in those drawings. Um, I mean, I just looked at them again, and I, I realized how much nuance um, and all the different values of black he gets out of the, the drawing tools. And I also kind of noticed what a limited, um, he limits his, design motifs, but he just works the heck out of them, and they're, they're beautiful. I mean, it is, if you look around the room, there you see a lot of squares, circles, um, triangles, and lines, but there is so much variation and development in, um, in that limited palette. So, um, but yeah, his influence is just inexplicable <laughs> I can't really it's huge so so Brian before I ask you to talk about this of the three of you who is still a practicing artist <laughs> yes. isn't that great that is outstanding right so that is awesome now Brian you're a little bit different 
right? Because Doug had a different influence yeah, on I'm, you. I'm the man up here. These are the women. <laughs> There's so many things I want to say to you about that statement, but we'll talk about that in private later, and Denise will have a lot to say to you. So, but you went out, you studied with Doug, but then you also came back and worked and took over Doug's responsibilities as the gallery coordinator for our fine arts gallery here at Mott Community College for a number of years. So maybe you can talk about some of his influences and what led you to um, kind of follow in his footsteps? Um, well, I did definitely follow. Um, he was, uh, I was going to do a little kind of background um, on the, the history of the gallery. Um, and then, but Patty and I go back. We're the, <laughs> the old people here. We were both in the uh, Sam Morello's drawing class in the fall of 66. That's when we started. And um, uh, we, had, we didn't have, I didn't have Doug as an instructor until I got to sculpture another year later. But um, so the important thing here is that uh, this gallery exists in the department because Sam Morello, the, the guy we keep mentioning, and Doug created the, the gallery program. Um, we were, at the time, um, sharing the facility um, at the Flint Institute of Arts um, that is now has the studios and offices and whatever. That was all studios at one time. It was uh, the, that facility was owned by the Flint Board of Education, so we had they had uh, college classes there, Flint Institute of Art classes, and uh, Flint uh, adult education and, and child education classes in that same facility. So um, what Sam and Doug did was take the, um, what was at the time, the art history classroom, um, the art history instructor moved over here to main campus and they turned that room, which was uh, really uh, exactly the same dimensions, 19 by 30 feet, uh, they turned that into a gallery. And um, Doug had, uh, this was mid 80s, uh, Doug had uh, retired from full time at that point and then uh, that was when he became the gallery coordinator. So it was an educational tool and still is, um, bringing in artists from outside the department, uh, having them do a lecture, talk with students, whatever, create this experience that we're having today. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, he was, on the other hand, uh, I was the technical assistant at that time, now called support specialist. That's the new guy, Josh, back there. Yeah, Josh He's Justice, yeah. Doing the job now. Um, so the, uh, the technical assistant or uh, support specialist uh, has the responsibility to work with the gallery coordinator in terms of making uh, things happen in the gallery with installation of the artwork, meeting the artist, and that kind of thing. So um, I was fortunate to be able to uh, work with Doug for uh, at when he was gallery coordinator and I was technical assistant for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And then um, he was... Uh, influential in uh, the fact that I became the gallery coordinator in the sense that he recommended me for the position. So I must say I was quite intimidated by the whole situation because Doug was um, so um, capable of uh, every little detail and uh, the, every formality and whatever involved with, uh, with being a gallery coordinator. And uh, I didn't 
think I was quite up to the the task in that regard, but uh, nevertheless, I did it myself uh, for about 15 years as well. I just gave it up, uh, I think it's three years ago already, but. So anyway, that's uh, my experience, as well as the fact that I had him for sculpture along the way, and before that, it's a long story, but, um, my parents knew him and his wife at that time, Sarah, and uh, so when I was told I was going to the community college, um, <laughs> <laughs> they uh, connected me with Doug because they knew him. So Doug actually sat down with me and helped me uh, fill out my first class schedule. Oh my goodness. So, um, so that's where the history goes with me up until he died, and then. Can I add something about your your lovely? They used to install shows all day, you know. When, they, and then they would come over. We'd have dinner, and um, <clears throat> Doug would come home, and he'd say, "We're like an old married couple." He <laughs> said, "Okay, so you had your choice of music for the first half." right and then for lunch then Doug could choose his music <laughs> stuff like that but they were I would go up there sometimes they would just be laughing and just you know yeah. they were like an old married couple and Doug just really I mean dearly loved all these guys but Brian was so special to him especially when Doug was in hospice how much he helped him you know when you <laughs> when you hung that thing and, I mean you were always there he could always count on this guy that's the kind of so anyway. Well, and that old married couple thing came <laughs> up because um, when we were installing work, we'd have uh, different opinions about the placement of the work or how to hang it, the height, and on and on. So we'd go kind of bickering back and forth for a while. So we labeled ourselves an old married couple <laughs> because of the bickering that went on. <laughs> it's interesting to hear you talk about like the, the kind of standards that Doug had, especially in this gallery, because I think that carries on um, in many ways because of you, Brian. You're very particular, and I think both myself and Professor Tim Kranz, who have worked with you and, and been involved in exhibitions with you, we're constantly asking ourselves what would Brian do and I think that's a, a, that's a def, definite reflection of what would Doug have done because when you turned over galleries, to, I mean Brian had like folders and folders of detailed notes about the gallery and that, that he um, had and I think a lot of that was Doug's influences. Oh, I'll bet, yeah. I've still got files of folders and folders. <laughs> Um, you said it, it's handmade paper, right? Right. And I remember, I think it was 1972, when he must have gone to that Twin Rocker, twin rocker paper uh -huh. studio and met the, the right. people who started that. And they were the people who were bringing handmade paper to this country. It was um, an amazing all place. Yeah, and he, he started going there. They, they were friends, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And making paper, and um, in our class, he got so excited about it that um, he had us place an order for papers from all over the place. And he ordered um, like Japanese rice papers for us to draw on in our advanced Ooh. drawing class. And wow. I remember that's when I first touched Kitakata, <laughs> and, which I still love as yeah. a, a paper. And you know, just like um, what other ones? Well, I, I have the whole glossary in my head, but I, I won't name them, but they had so many different textures and surfaces and it really affected the way your drawings looked. Before that, we were just drawing on something like what those are on, the, the white, uh, the Joshua, yeah, or even a bond paper, you know. But and yeah, then, he's got then we started using the French right. papers. and I might have some extra paper for you too. <laughs> oh, I have, I have <laughs> extra paper. <laughs> I take paper. Okay, okay. I so, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Denise, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say, as Darcy was talking about the paper making and the influence that Doug had on our, making our own paper ourselves, but then I went, oh my gosh, he's really making paper <laughs> all around the room. Well, to me anyway. <laughs> Well, yeah. you know, you, you talked about, like, kind of this opportunity to kind of explore, figure things out for yourself, and talking about paper making, like Doug's own explorations kind of influencing what he did in the classroom. Was there a lot of that? Was there a lot of that kind of like, oh, Doug was interested, and now he's learned something new, so now he's bringing that into you all to play and, and to experience? Specifically, I, I recall that, but I remember other projects like in two-dimensional design where, you know, he was just open to any little kernel of an idea that you might suggest to him. He, I think he would start getting fireworks about it and then just really help you form that into something. And um, there were, if there were technical concerns, which there always were, he knew how to, how to surmount them. So. You know, that's one of the things I didn't know is how to handle specific materials. Um, like we did things with plexiglass, I remember, and, and polyester resin and things like that. And so it's just, he could really help you push your ideas forward. I am really glad that we didn't use that polyester resin for very long because it's very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I was reminded um, when Denise and Darcy started talking about those influences, uh, the other thing that was uh, critical for the department um, that Doug and Sam um, influenced dramatically was, uh, for instance, uh, when Patty and I were students, uh, there was no uh, printmaking offered um, Doug uh, Sam built that program you know he wrote the the uh, class description or whatever the he created that course in other words um, and Doug um, actually uh, created the uh, bronze casting uh, facility as part of uh, sculpture uh, very rare for a community college to do bronze casting. Um, I remember when I left to go to school elsewhere, uh, I would talk to students that came from four-year schools and, that uh, had no bronze casting. So uh, those of us that uh, were there uh, got an experience or experiences that um, didn't exist elsewhere, so we we learned a lot thanks to Doug and Sam building the department. Um, Diane, Doug created. They were talking about advanced drawing, um, mostly uh, in uh, uh, first and second year programs. It's uh, two semesters of drawing, whatever drawing one, drawing two whatever, Doug added advanced drawing for students uh, to experience, like Darcy was saying, different kinds of papers, different kinds of drawing materials, um, whatever. So they were very um, influential and inspired to teach, literally create teaching experiences. Denise? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say something very brief about the bronze casting. Thanks to Doug, I got that question totally right on some art exam I had to take when I was in college. <laughs> 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 and the papers, yeah, advanced drawing was really amazing. It's like you got your freedom and off you went. It was great. So, Patty, why did you choose the name Cycles for this exhibition? Um, well, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that was one of the words as part 
there's a word in one of his artist statements, and so the cycle continues. And actually, that's on his on his tombstone, or his great his um, what do you call it? Mm -hmm. His ashes at Great Lakes, because he's always on a journey. He was always searching, always you know. It took he didn't stop here; just went from here to there. I mean, these guys can can relate to that. He would like. I mean, how did you know that it would go from handmade paper and scribbles of watercolor to these? I mean, it just went on. And it, it's still, I mean, I don't know what people said, what is your favorite series? And I can't say. I really can't. I mean, um, they're all beautiful. They are, yeah. And they're all just, I mean, I, there's only two triangles in here this one and that one, but. Um, or pyramid series. Did he call them pyra pyramid the series? Pyramid, yeah. I wanted to ask Patty. Um, okay. I mentioned this to you earlier, but did he ever cite his artistic influences, like people who really inspired him? Well, um, he had a ton of art books. I think a lot of people influenced him. I mean, we were talking about Cy Twombly. Yeah. Which you, you could said he had a lot of books. Cy Twombly. Yeah. Uh, Motherwell, I mean, what were some of the, but I don't, I mean, ev uh, so looking to the art books, I mean, everyone, yeah. almost Native, well, Native American artists yeah. Yeah. who actually, you know, and, um, but I'm sure if I would have asked him, he probably could have given me four or mm -hmm. five people that were the big influences. What do you think? Did he ever tell you? No, not in particular. I was just going to mention Richard Hunt. Um, oh, Richard as Hunt, yeah. Artists that he knew yeah. and worked with right. and admired. And yeah. That's a stainless steel sculpture out there across the creek uh, done by Richard Hunt, who was uh, uh, Doug and Richard were good friends. Yeah, and, and Richard just passed away uh, mm -hmm. recently. And. Um, and he's, what a great a person. I mean, oh. when he was installing that, we had the opportunity. He came over here and he's talked with our sad. students. And just the kindest, most generous he person so of sharing humble. his time with our students and us. Yeah. Yeah, he was awesome. He taught too, right? Pardon? He was a teacher too, right? No, no, no. Uh-uh. Oh. We would go and visit him in Chicago oh, all the okay. time. He was just like, we would call, everyone would refer to him as the all shucks guy. Because he didn't, you know, oh, that's just a sculpture. You know, he never, you know, he was so humble. But he was uh, just a really, really good person, a lot of fun, too. But I, that doesn't surprise me that he would take the time, because, again, he wanted, he always wanted to. I don't think he taught Darcy, but that I know of. I think he just, but he would talk to classes and stuff. So, Darcy, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now with your art? <laughs> Well, about 10 years ago, I was do working in printmaking, and then I r retired from teaching, and I, I actually wanted to start a community studio in printmaking. Oh, and I wanted to start it with, oh, who's the printmaker? Bigelow? Oh. No, this son, Ben, ben Bigelow, yeah. and we, he thought that was a good idea. And then he went and had twins and became the um, live stay-at-home dad. So, <laughs> you know, that wasn't going to happen. So around that time, I found a ceramic studio, and I've been working there ever since. Well, two different studios, but um, so I'm working in clay. Oh. And some of the recent things I've been doing is um, uh, modeling in 3D modeling software, Rhino, but um, not digitally printing it, uh, not ceramic printing. Um, actually having the software make, um, well, I get a flat pattern, like a sewing pattern from the software, and then I lay that on my clay slabs, cut around it, and assemble the, uh. the work. So that's one of the things I, I work on. Do you yeah. have a show coming up or anything? Uh, well, I'm in a cup show that opens on Friday well, at, the, at the Ann Arbor Art Center, okay. come to think of it. And um, in the summers, I've been showing up in Glen Arbor. 
at the center gallery. Um, and I do a lot of home sales. So. I think you need to do a workshop on that technique. Oh, and I do workshops. All I'm, right. I'm starting um, a silk screening on clay workshop in, in about two weeks. <laughs> Are you really? Yeah, we'll in Ann Arbor. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. Well, I, I love teaching that. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> well, I didn't mean you had to stop talking. I'm sorry. No, but I we'll definitely talk about that later. Yeah. So, Oh, no, don't hand that away. What are you working on? Because yeah. you need to come back. Yeah, I, I know. To, I need to see you working on stuff around here. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do One time Sam Morello said to me when he saw me after a, a, a long amount of time, I had, I, when I went to college, I majored in everything. Well, not everything. Ceramics, drawing, painting, anything. And he said that that was very sad. I know this is about Doug. Yeah, he said someone should have made me choose something. <laughs> and I think about that statement all the time, and I still don't know what I would choose because they're all kind of wonderful. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to choose. Well, I understand the concept of choosing, though. It's like you get to focus. So, anyway, what am I doing now? I'm uh, doing everything. And anything I can find out in the street or in the forest, <laughs> I bring it home to put into my art. And I just started trying to put little things out there in the world. Uh, I have lots of issues. Anyway, um, what else did you want to know from me? Yeah. Art. Yeah? <laughs> oh, well, printmaking. I will, I, I was at Wayne State a uh, long time ago, and I was short three credit hours or to graduate, and I went, well, never mind what I said. But I had never taken printmaking, and then I got that last three hours of work was in printmaking, and I fell in love with that, intaglio printmaking. Oh. And then I came back here to Mott. I've done painting here, but that was a long time ago. Printmaking most recently, which I truly, truly love, and ceramics, which I truly, truly love, but now ceramics is gone, so I don't have, I, I, uh, I talk too much, don't I? No, okay. I thought that was a dig at me. No. <laughs> so I took over that studio. <laughs> well, the only reason why you took it over is because they emptied it out. That has nothing to do with you. I put screen printing in that room. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway. Uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask me another specific question. Cause well, uh, you know, the work that you were, were exhibiting last fall when we had that show of former students and okay. your, like, little found object things yeah. that were, was amazing. So I look forward to seeing more of that in the future. Thank you. That was very kind of you. Just truth. Thank you. <laughs> How about you, Brian? Um, well, that just reminded me... Um, Another way, the, what I've been thinking about with uh, Doug and Sam Morello and other people that I was fortunate enough to work with and know in this department, um, the idea is, uh, is making things happen. So uh, as students, you need to make things happen for yourself. Denise mentioned going to Wayne State. Uh, we lived in Birmingham at the time in the 70s, and uh, she used to ride the bus carrying a painting from Birmingham all the way down to Detroit and back. So um, that was how committed she was. Um, so do what you have to do and never stop working. But Anyway, um, what I was uh, supposed to be saying was uh, Sam Morello, again, 
And uh, another uh, member of the faculty at the time, uh, his name was Tom Newsom. He's since passed away. Doug is gone. Sam is gone. So uh, their legacy lives on, in other words, uh, with Sam and Tom Newsom, they were instrumental in uh, creating um, the gallery downtown called Buckham Fine, Fine Arts Project. Um, one of the few nonprofit um, galleries probably in the country that was able to sustain itself over 40 years. We're looking at, this is the 40th anniversary year uh, of Buckham Gallery. And uh, so it was Sam and uh, Tom Newsom and then several other people, Gary Gebhardt, his name came up. He actually owned and still owns the building uh, where, they, uh, where the gallery was first located, upstairs uh, on 2nd Street. The gallery has since moved downstairs and across the street, thanks to uh, the Mott Foundation. And uh, so I mention that because uh, I was one of the first uh, participants in an exhibition at Buckham Gallery in 1984. So I've been invited to um, have a piece in their 40th anniversary exhibition, which is coming up in May. So um, I'm thankful for the fact that uh, that gallery was created because over the years it provided a place for me and many, many people to exhibit their work. Um, if it hadn't been there, I don't know, hopefully I would have done other things, but um, it was there, it was local. We knew, uh, those of us that lived and worked in the area, knew the people that uh, ran the gallery, and so it was very comfortable in that sense to be able to go there and show your work. And uh, we had a 50th oh, birthday that's party. That's there. Right, we did. <laughs> <laughs> we created an exhibition. Yeah. It was uh, Patty, me, Gary Gebhardt, who owned the building, still owns the building. Uh, Tom Bonnert, who's former faculty here, um, and another uh, Tom Fardell. interloper. He, yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't. We were all fifty. We all were the same age um, at that time. So that we made it into a birthday party celebration. But the idea was that rather than us receiving gifts, we donated works um, that uh, the gallery could sell to raise money and we then invited um, a couple or more artists that we knew, uh, asked them if they would donate work and so that work was on the wall as well as our work around the gallery so we uh, could that way um, help the gallery sustain itself. Um, we got a whole bunch of cupcakes, and uh, <laughs> we sang happy birthday at the opening and whatever. It was a lot of fun. So, and again, making things happen. So I'm wondering um, if at this point there's any questions from anyone in the audience. Mark <laughs> I guess it'd be a question for Patty. I'm noticing in our home we have um, several paintings of Doug's with the ladder theme. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed here there's quite a few with the ladder. And I wondered if that's something that was special to him or they just happened oh. to turn out that way or what? No, that the ladders, he added the ladders. Thank they you. were very special to him. I think it was all part of this uh, primitive, um, you know, like, I don't know. I, I, there's one artist statement that explains it better. But they were, it wasn't just like, oh, let's put a ladder in here. He. I think, wasn't Anastasi uh, yeah. Native American? Yeah. Part of Pueblo Anasazi, I mean, it's with the Native American cultures and religions and stuff like that. But. <laughs> 
Hi, uh, I own a, a Warner myself, and uh, I love it, and it's part of the Notation series. Um, so my piece is predominantly white, but <clears throat> I remember you saying one time, Patty, that Doug spent an incredible amount of hours on all of these mm -hmm. and worked with layers of black to get a depth and a color uh, in each one of them. Like I say, mine's predominantly white, but do you have any idea how many hours average he would spend per per notation series? Um, that's a good question, Ken. Um, because it really, because I remember he would. Um, can you hear me? I remember um, when he would start a painting, it would be almost like how this was. He would just he'd lather on the first coat. Let it dry. Think about it. He would do maybe little sketches, but never really, nothing was carved in stone, if you pardon the pun. And then, um, so then, it, to, it seems like if I, starting on a Monday, say he goes to the studio, and he, because all the different layers, he wipes the top color off, sits down for a while, and then keeps, you know, layering, keeps gouging, keeps drawing. So probably, I don't know, as hours go, I would say, what's a good hour? I wouldn't know how. He would, he would, take, he would take about, at least to do a completed one that he was happy with, about a week. Yeah. But I love that one of yours because he doesn't have very many white ones. And you can see all the layers that are like underneath it. Right. Thank you, Mr. Van Wagener. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I have a question, Patty. Um, where did um, Doug's fascination with the Puebla culture and Native American um, uh, culture come from? What inspired him to create these? The, uh, they're almost like cave paintings. Right, right. Um, well, he's always been, he's from Oklahoma, so his heritage is, I think he's like a, you know, little itch of uh, Cherokee in him. But he's always been interested and fascinated by Native American history, their art, their religion. And so it really started way back when he was a young man. And then he would, he studied about them and he got to be good friends with um, a gentleman named Dick Port in Flint who um, collected, he lived with the Native American, the Sioux, and he's got this huge collection. So they would spend hours talking and go, going over everything. So I think it just, it basically came from that way back, yeah. Anyone else? So I have a question for each of you, and it's gonna end with you, Patty. Oh dear. Favorite memory of Doug? <laughs> I know, right? It's the hardest question ever, right? Well, this is just a humorous moment. It doesn't have anything to do with art education, but one time I uh, just was clopping down the hallway and I had these new shoes. They were, they were wooden clogs, but they were lime green. And he said something like, I love those red shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm privileged to say that I've had dinner with the Warners. Thank you very much. And one time when we were there, I was trying to be helpful in the kitchen. Doug was there. He was in the kitchen. And uh, there was nothing I could do, which, yeah. But I just started talking about my job, teaching, and things that were going on. And I don't think I'll ever forget how he said to me, they're not doing right by you. They should be encouraging you and bringing out the most that they can with the teacher that they have in you. And 
It was wonderful. Uh, uh, I thank you, Doug, very much for that. It has helped me many times. Uh, I've drawn a blank here. Because um, there were so many years that uh, I spent with Doug and uh, knew him and his wife, and Patty, and whatever, on and on. So um, I guess it's mostly just uh, the memory of the things I already mentioned. I was going to mention, let me mention about him again, farther back. Uh, interesting. Uh, he was a very good golfer. Uh, everything he did, he did very well. So... Uh, <laughs> And I remember hearing uh, at one time he considered um, trying to become a pro golfer. He, he was that good. So um, there's a memory. <laughs> All of them are fond. So, Patty? Well, that's, I mean... So what can I say? Uh, but speaking of golf, he turned me into the tomboy. He, I never threw a ball, a baseball, never golfed or anything. And he said, you are a tomboy. And he taught me, I could, you know, I can't anymore, but I could, I had a really mean split finger fork ball <laughs> that he taught. And, um, he was so proud of me, got me for my 40th birthday. He bought me my own Louisville Slugger with my name on it and my own glove that I, he said you have to oil it and sleep on, on top of it. <laughs> and then he taught me how to golf and he just worked with me and worked with me. And, and so, I mean, we, so many other things too, but the sports thing, because I never, I never did sports. And he just said, yeah, come, t I'll take you under my wing and, but yeah, but also his love of so many things. In his later life, he loved cooking and everything, loved to cook for these people. But he just always adored his, he never forgot his students. Remember that one time at your, par at your house and Gerhard was there and it was, Ted was there? Yeah, it was uh, really cool. Oh yeah. yeah, that was really cool. We had. <laughs> We had a lot of the students there. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. So anyway, it's, um, that's my memory. <laughs> huh? Birds and animals. Oh, birds and animals. Oh, yes. We had two birds and two dogs. Now I'm just down to one bird. <laughs> but um, no, he just, yeah, he loved his birds and his, do his dogs. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, he loved his friends, his family. And, and he me. loved the old Tiger Stadium. Oh, yes. The old Tiger Stadium. We fought to keep that. Yeah. <laughs> so we just, yeah. We were married like 32 years, something like that. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I can't thank all three of you enough for coming in today to share I can't your, I know, you. right? They're, how great ah. for the three of them for coming in today. I like to deserve a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for sharing your memories with us. And Patty, I wanna thank you because you didn't even hesitate when I reached out to you and okay. said, hi, Doug was a big influence. I know he was a big influence. And would you please be willing to show his work? And you were like, absolutely. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and would you be willing to do a talk? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, but I think this is really nice because, you know, I think the title of Cycles, this is a new cycle of our students being reintroduced for the first time to Doug and his work. And it introduces him to the community um, in a new way, which I think is outstanding. So thank you so much thank for you. your time. You. So you have been amazing. So thank you. Oh, thank you.
Yeah, I also want to thank Josh Justice, who is our art support speci specialist, but he is also our gallery coordinator now as well. So thank you for making this exhibition happen and working with Patty. To Brian Williams from our media services department for live streaming this and making this a smooth process. So thank you, Brian, for all your help there. So, uh, Doug's exhibition will be up through next Friday, so tell your friends, tell them to come. The live stream of this will be available, we'll post it on our Facebook page, we'll get it out on our MCC website as well, so you'll be able to watch that again if somebody wants to see it. Patty, you can watch, go back and let us know how we did. Um, uh, our next exhibition will happen in April, which will be featuring former faculty member uh, Doug, uh, John Dempsey. Um, John, some of, I, yeah, right, exciting. Some of his works on paper, um, they just got delivered today. Yeah, they just came in. So we'll be doing that, and we are looking, we're working with John to put a Zoom presentation because he is out of state now. So hopefully we'll be having a talk with him and get to hear a little bit about his work. And that will conclude our centennial celebration in the gallery this year for Mott's 100th anniversary. And, um, and then in May, we hope you all come back and join us for our student art show, which will be featuring all the amazing work that happened this year. So thank you all for coming. Thanks for everyone who's watching. And again, thanks to all of you for your time today. Thank you.